on September 22, 1993, one of the worst train wrecks in American history would occur in a remote, swampy river in Mobile, Alabama. From the surface, the mistake seemed quite simple, a towboat getting lost and hitting a bridge. However, upon taking a closer look, diving deep into the NTSB's final report, it shows that this wreck was a lot more than just one simple wrong turn, and has shared similarities from accidents far before Amtrak's formation in 1971 and after. This would be known as the Big Bayou Disaster. September 21st, 1993, 9.30 at night. The crew of Amtrak train number two, the Sunset Limited, is on its way to New Orleans, Louisiana for a recrew and station stop. The train is traveling from Los Angeles, California to Miami, Florida on a nearly 700 mile journey that should j take just over 20 hours. It consists of three locomotives, those being a GE P40DC, number 819, which was a mere 20 days old at the time, followed by two older 70s era EMD F40 PHRs, number 262 and 312. They are pulling one baggage car, one crew dorm car that transitions from low to high level, and six superliner double deck passenger cars, three being coaches, one lounge, one diner, and one sleeper. 220 passengers and crew were on board. Unfortunately, the train encounters a minor delay in New Orleans. Both an air conditioner and a toilet were not working and needed servicing. By the time the repairs are completed, the train departs at 11.34 p.m., running over a half an hour late. Around the time the train passes Houston, Texas, a set of barges loaded with steel slabs and coke coal pushed by the tugboat Malvilla, owned and operated by the Warrior and Gulf Navigation of Chickasaw, Alabama, was steaming down the Mobile River in Mobile, Alabama. The captain, Andrew Statler, is downstairs in the bunks, leaving the much less experienced towboat pilot, Willie Odom, in charge of moving the ship. Willie, while said to be a good towboat pilot, was not properly trained on how to read his radar, and so, due to the very poor visibility and heavy fog and his lack of experience, did not realize he was off course. The boat also lacked a compass and a chart of the waters. Odom believed he was still on the Mobile River. In reality, he had turned left, not right, leaving the Mobile River and was now sailing up the Big Bayou Canet Tributary an area not usually traveled by ships. Willie was having trouble trying to see through the fog, so he decided to park his barges by leaving them near the bank of the river and wait for the fog to lift. This, as a consequence, is why he accidentally turned onto the big bayou. He was traveling no more than two knots, looking for a familiar tree to drop anchor. He eventually notices something on the radar, not wanting to guess if it was a tugboat or a bridge, he put the ship in full reverse. But then, there's a thud. The barges had struck something at 2.45 a.m. After his captain awoke to see what the matter was, he took control and reversed the ship. They parked the barges by the bank and would wait for the fog to lift and assess the damage on whatever they hit. What he and Willie didn't know is that they actually struck the bridge that spans the big bayou on the CSX m and subdivision, and that the impact had bent the rails into an impassable kink, as well as dislodged part of the bridge three feet from its original placement. 
Meanwhile, the Sunset Limited is heading down that very subdivision, passing clear signals, unaware of the danger ahead at over 72 miles an hour. The train passed the last signal that was a mile and a half before the bridge. There was nothing that was going to stop the train now. At 2.53 a.m. September 22nd, 1993, the Sunset Limited derailed over the Mobile River in Alabama. The locomotives went airborne as half of the Consus plunges into the river below. 819 impales itself on the other side of the bayou and buries itself 46 feet in the mud, instantly killing the engineer. 262 and 312 fall not too far away and 312's fuel tank is ripped open, spilling diesel fuel into the river, eventually starting a fire. The passenger cars are either fully or half submerged, with some beginning to burn from the fire as passengers desperately try to escape via the emergency windows. They were still mostly disoriented from being awakened by the impact, and with the only light being from the fire itself, many didn't know where the safety of the bank was. There was also a third danger, not just the fire or the water, but the river was home to alligators and venomous snakes, such as rattlesnakes. One of the cars, Coach 34040, had its front axles dangling over where the bridge used to be and the rest of the Consus stayed on the bridge without any damage. The tugboat crew witnessed a glow of fire in the distance and soon realized that a train had derailed on the bridge right in front of them. Both them, the train crew, and CSX dispatchers dial 911 were making mayday calls about the accident. Okay, you with the Amtrak train? Yes, ma'am. I'm the supervisor on board. We're on the Mobile River. You on the Mobile River? On the Mobile River. We got cars burning there over the bridges. Out there's people in the water. We're trying to help them, but so we need all kind of help. help. Yes, ma'am. We need help. Ma'am, I have to go and assist these folks. The tugboat crew, after leaving the barges by the edge of the river, did the best they could in pulling at least 17 survivors from the wreck, continuing to help as the Coast Guard and other emergency services arrived a half hour later in the remote location. When it was all said and done, 47 people had been killed, most by drowning, a few from the impact, namely the engineer, 
and the rest succumbed to the fire and smoke. One of those deaths was Trayman Ronald Quaytons, who was trapped in the crew dorm car. Despite efforts from both passengers and other crew members to open the door of the car to save him, he burned alive in the car, said to be reciting the 23rd Psalm until he met his end. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. I'll follow who on heaven. 103 people were injured. It was the worst train wreck in Amtrak's history and the worst since the 1958 Newark Bay Bridge disaster on the Central Railroad of New Jersey, which killed 48. From the surface, the accident was just a boat hitting the bridge, damaging it, but the full story is a lot more in-depth than that. Upon investigation of the bridge, it was clear that Malvillo's front left and center barges had hit the barge near the central section. Well, you, here you have missing concrete. So it was obvious that this chipped off. There's also some chipping of the concrete closer to the water. That wasn't enough to collapse the bridge, as the concrete pillar and barge only suffered chips and scratches, but looking deeper, the impact had also bent a steel girder toward the tracks. It was also found that the 1909-era bridge, when it was being designed and built for the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, a predecessor to the track's current owner, CSX, they had built it essentially as three bridges in one. First up was a steel truss bridge, measuring 180.5 feet. The third part was a mere wooden trestle, measuring 210 feet and the first and third sections were resting on the second section on a swinging bridge, which would swing open to allow ships to pass through by swinging perpendicular to the tracks. It's like a turntable, but on the water. It rested on a concrete pier with a steel girder bridge on top, measuring 151 feet. While labeled as a swinging bridge in the design process, upon a closer inspection, the investigators were in for a surprise. The necessary parts and equipment to allow the bridge to swing were never installed, leaving the swinging bridge part basically half finished. The bridge also wasn't exactly fully connected to the two other sections, making it basically floating in limbo near the other sections that rested on top of its pier. The spans were only connected via continuous welded rail that spanned across all three sections. Yet it remained this way for over 84 years until the accident occurred. When the barge hit the bridge, the rails buckled into a sharp kink, but didn't separate, leaving the track circuit intact and allowing the Sunset Limited to still have a clear signal to proceed across into certain danger. Had the rails separated, the track circuit would have been broken or pretend that the track was occupied by another train, giving the Sunset Limited a stop aspect allowing the Sunset Limited to stop way before touching the bridge. This would also be the case if the bridge was opened for the ship to pass through. This factor would also come into play in other accidents, such as a Union Pacific wreck in Devil Side, Utah on November 19, 1979, when a front-end loader struck a bridge that eventually derailed a 120-car freight train, and again two years later after the Big Bayou accident, on October 9th, 1995, in Palo Verde, Arizona, with the same train, when the Amtrak Sunset Limited derailed on a bridge after a supposed neo-Nazi group sabotaged the track while keeping the track circuit intact. In this case, though, the barge had hit the bridge, but the train hitting the kink and bouncing off a bent girder of the bridge allowed the whole bridge to finally collapse and plunge into the river below. In a shocking twist, though, the pilot of the tugboat, Willie Odom, was never held criminally responsible for the accident. Instead, blame was placed on the foggy weather and the bridge's messy design. Either way, Willie gave up his piloting license and never operated on tugboats ever again. He would eventually pass away by 2013. The tugboat company, Warrior and Gulf Navigation, had to pay over $1.4 million in settlements for the families of the victims. 
CSX, though, who owned and maintained the bridge, were also never found criminally responsible for the crash, despite the NTSB's strong criticism of the state of the bridge, and while CSX didn't build the bridge in the first place, they still had to keep an eye on it. The NTSB stated, had the bridge be built as a fixed girder bridge and not a half-finished swinging mechanism, let alone installing shear blocks to lock the mechanism, the bridge would have been damaged but not cause any harm to the rails above. Also, had the Sunset Limited not be delayed in New Orleans, Louisiana, it would have passed over the bridge 23 minutes before it was struck. A fatal delay. Going back to the 1979 Utah wreck, right after that happened, the Federal Railroad Administration did a feasibility study on installing a signal mechanism that would trigger a stop aspect for a severely bent track that wasn't a mere heat kink. The finding was that the overall costs would unfortunately outweigh the benefits. Not to mention, throwing more technology at a problem won't always solve it. But some changes did still come after this incident such as more strict training for tugboat pilots and making sure all pilots had and knew how to use radar, maps, and compasses for navigation, not only take them with them on every journey. Anyone that wasn't sufficiently trained in any of these navigation methods would not be allowed to pilot a vessel. After the accident, all three locomotives were hoisted up and later scrapped. 819 was the first Genesis series diesel locomotive to officially be written off and scrapped. All the passenger cars that ended up in the water were also scrapped. The rest of the equipment that did not derail returned to service. Coach 34040, however, still bears the scars of that fateful day, a chilling reminder of its narrow escape. The bridge was rebuilt shortly after the accident with an improved fixed design and continues to carry CSX freight trains to this very day. The Sunset Limited, though, doesn't continue on to Miami, Florida anymore. It was scaled back to New Orleans, Louisiana indefinitely after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and despite CSX repairing the tracks affected by the hurricane in 2006, the route hasn't been extended anymore. Talks have been in place over the years to re-extend the route again, but as of 2022, Amtrak schedules and maps describe the route between Mobile and Orlando as suspended. 30 years later, the worst train wreck in Amtrak's history still remains as a series of mistakes, unfortunate coincidences, and poor weather as well, but it was ultimately a train and a barge being in the wrong places at the wrong times.